Well, good morning. Welcome. Glad you made it on time. Proud of you. Good job. Made it through the rain. Lost an hour of sleep. It's a good thing. You know, it's my favorite time of the year, though, because I love having more light at the end of the day. Amen. Uh, it's, it's good. It's great. So I'm glad you're all here. My name is uh, Pastor Joel, one of the pastors here. Pastor Scott's uh, out for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but it's good to be here. I'm just uh, continuing on this uh, I Am uh, series that we've been uh, journeying through. So a few weeks ago, uh, this is kind of a fun story, I, I was asked in our staff meeting at church to uh, talk about what was going on this Easter to kind of fill the staff in, because um, as I, uh, myself and the worship department, we kind of put together all the things for the week before Easter and the, the new life celebration and uh, the Easter services and everything, and so uh, I was asked to fill in uh, on what was going on, and I was told to start at the beginning. So I gathered myself, I contemplated a little bit, and I said, it was a dark and stormy night in Bethlehem. <laughs> a woman named Mary, along with her husband Joseph, had traveled into town. She was well with child, so they were looking for a place to stay. But there was no room in the inn. So they entered a stable, and there was born in a manger, Jesus Christ. And this was the beginning. And I'm like, okay, that was probably more the beginning than you were asking for at this moment, but I had fun. At least I didn't start with Genesis 1-1 and go through the whole entire Bible uh, for the uh, entire staff. But... Uh, you know, in, in the same way, though, today, we're going to be looking specifically at, at John 14, 6. That's where the I am statement is, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, but to fully appreciate this moment and to kind of uh, to, to, to gather ourselves in the mindset of the, the disciples to whom Jesus is speaking, uh, this I am statement, I really want to go back to the beginning and not to Genesis. We're not going to go through the whole Bible this morning and not even to Jesus' birth, but I want to go back to the beginning of when Jesus calls his disciples because I want to help us get into the mindset a little bit of, of this uh, range of emotion that the disciples must have been feeling. So if we have uh, Luke uh, chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. It's not 15. Maybe we'll change that by next service. Luke 5, chapter 1 through 11. And Jesus calls his first disciples. And you can look it up, or it's going to be on the screens here as well. It says this. It says, One day as Jesus was uh, standing by the lake of Genesis, or that's the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Then they came and filled both boats full, so much full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell to Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So this is the beginning, the call of the disciples. And I'm sure for them in that moment that it was amazing to see all those fish to see uh, this man, Jesus, say, just go ahead and, and pull it over. He says, I've caught nothing, but he pulls the net so full, they fill one boat, and obviously the boats were built to carry enough fish that they would catch on a normal basis. But this net pulled up so many fish that it filled one boat, it filled another boat so much that they were sinking. I mean, that had to have been amazing to see. 
So they know there's something special about this man. And so they decide to leave everything, leave it all behind, drop their nets, uh, leave, leave their jobs, leave their livelihood, leave everything that they had built for themselves. And they go and they follow Jesus. And this was probably uh, the best decision they could have ever made because as they go on this journey, this is some of the things that they see Jesus do. They see Jesus turn water into wine. They watch Jesus feed uh, more than 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and some fish. They watch a man who was born blind see because of Jesus. They watch Jesus resurrect Lazarus from the dead. I mean, this is an amazing life to have led. An amazing journey that they had, all because they dropped everything, they let go of everything, and they chose to follow Jesus. They made that choice for themselves. So let's fast forward now to John chapter 12. The disciples, you, you've dropped everything, you've seen all these amazing things, now, in John chapter 12, um, there's just life couldn't be better for Jesus and his disciples. This is like the, 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 the po most popular that Jesus and his disciples that they, they ever were. Now, there are a few people who wanted to have him arrested and killed, but, you know, who doesn't? And, uh, but, but to the disciples, Jesus seemed unstoppable. Everything was going his way. Everything was going uh, their way. So in chapter 12, the beginning, we have Jesus coming to the house of, of uh, Mary and Martha, and we know that Lazarus was their, their brother, and so he was there, and uh, Mary breaks this uh, expensive perfume, and she anoints Jesus. And then in verse 9, it says this. It says, Meanwhile, as, as this anointing was happening, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. So they come to see Jesus and Lazarus. And so the chief priests, they actually made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So it's just, Jesus is getting super popular. People are coming. If you remember, there was uh, mourners that came from Jerusalem to be with Mary and Martha. And so there was a lot of people there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now news was spreading. Here's this guy, Jesus, you, you've heard about. But did you know he actually raised someone from the dead? And so they're going to see, yes, there's Lazarus. There he is. He's sitting in the house having dinner. And there's Jesus. They're together. And so people are just going crazy. Who is this man who has control of death himself, that, that death could actually be conquered by this man, that someone would come out. And so you're excited as this disciple, like, man, people are coming to see us. This is great. Then in verse 12, it says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and went out to meet him, meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the king of Israel. People are shouting, blessed is the king of Israel. They're proclaiming Jesus as king. So life has to be pretty exciting, right? Friends of the king. I mean, you're feeling pretty good about your choice now to drop down the nets. I mean, everything's going great. Everything's exciting. I mean, you're like, you're hanging out. You are walking into Jerusalem with the king. Things are going good. Everybody's happy. You're, you're going to go just conquer the world. You know, even the, uh, the Pharisees saw the popularity of Jesus. In verse 17, it says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he performed the sign, they went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world is going after him. So even the Pharisees are saying, this guy is just getting way too popular. The whole world is going after him. Now this is an important statement by the Pharisees, that the whole world has gone after him. Just look in verse 20, and we have a, kind of an interesting thing that I just want to take some, a brief time looking at. It says, uh, verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. And you have to ask yourselves, what are Greeks doing at a Jewish festival? They really shouldn't be interested in it. They wouldn't really be welcome. 
But here we're told there were some Greeks that went to the festival. Why would they be there? We find in 21 exactly why they're there. They came to Philip, one of the disciples who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. That's why they're there. They'd heard about him too. The whole world was going after him. Said, we would like to see Jesus. And so Philip goes to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, in turn, they tell Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus says this. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, if you remember, throughout the Gospels, uh, the, 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 the books just telling us about the account of Jesus Christ, he often says, my hour has not come. The hour has not come. The hour has not come. My hour has not come. He says it again and again. And these are after all these amazing miracles, off these different things. He's like, no, my hour has not come. But now here, some Greeks come to see him, and all of a sudden, he turns to the disciples, and he says, my hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And why he says it right here is because Jesus did not come to be the king of the Jews. He came to be the savior of the world. And now the whole world has gone after him. The whole world has come to see him. The whole world is coming to hear about him, to meet him. And so now he says, my hour has come. It's time. But now I, I want to pass on now from chapter 12, because, uh, but my main objective here and why I've kind of gone through this is I want to help you to get into this mindset of a disciple. So you, you've been called up into this awesome adventure. You've left everything behind. You've watched multitude of miraculous things. You've watched Jesus ride into Jerusalem like a king, ready to conquer, which is totally what you thought was going to happen. And then in chapters 13 through 17 in the Gospel of John, there's this private meeting that you have with Jesus as you eat the Passover meal. It's the meeting in the upper room and as they eat together and um, and there Jesus just has this intimate conversation with him, or with all of them. And it's an intimate moment. As we read through the Gospels, we read that he, he washes their feet, he, he eats with them. It says that they reclined on him. It's this very um, just intimate moment with just his group of people. And during this time, so you've gone from this high, everything is going great. People are proclaiming Jesus as king. And then Jesus says in the next chapter, in verse 33, he says of chapter 13, he says, I'm going away. You're what? You're what? I'm going away. Well, why? Why are you going away? And we see in, in verse 36 of chapter 13, you know, Peter's, you know, probably relaxed. He's excited. They're probably all talking about, wow, wow, Jesus, that was great. Did you see the amount of crowds? Did you see that they were calling your name? They, you see that they were, they were calling you king, Jesus. This is awesome. What are we go, where are we going next? What are we doing? What are we conquering next? What miracle are we going to do together? What are we going to do? And he says, I'm going away. Wait, Lord, where, where are you going? That's what Peter says in verse 36. Where, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where am I going? Where I am going, you cannot follow now. But you will follow later. Peter says, well, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I dropped everything to follow you. I dropped my life. I left everything behind, my livelihood, my family, my friends, my job, everything. I left it all behind to follow you, so I'm going to follow you now. In fact, Jesus, I would lay my life down for you. Why can't I do it? And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. And if you go through all the accounts of the Last Supper in the Gospels, you hear Jesus say not only that he was going away, but you hear that he would die. You would hear that one of the 12 was a traitor. You will hear that Peter will disown him three times. You will hear that Satan was at work against all of them. And you will hear that all of the disciples would fall away. So now imagine your feelings. Imagine your mindset. You just went from the highest of high, wondering what 
kingdom, what thing you were going to conquer next, what miraculous thing you were going to be a part of with, with this Jesus who you dropped everything to follow. And he says this, he's going to die. He's going away. The 12, the, one of their friends is a traitor. They're going to disown him. Satan's at work against him. That they're all, all of them, every one of them is going to go away. So capture your thoughts now. I'm sure you feel discouraged. You feel sad. You feel lonely, maybe angry, but you definitely feel distressed. What's going to happen with me next? But Jesus, being a good father who takes care of his children, he brings comfort in our distress. And the conversation that, that, that follows is going to prepare them for what he's going to do and what he has planned. So now we're here in chapter 14 in John. And he says this, verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If we're not so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And that's comfort. God says, I want you to be with me. So badly I want you to be with me that I have this plan and I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to take you to that place to be with me. And Jesus is trying to explain to them this amazing place where he's going, the amazing place that he's preparing, kind of saying, you think the raising the dead was a cool thing? You think riding into Jerusalem and being called king is a cool thing? Wait until you see heaven. Wait until you see a place that I'm going to prepare for you. This is nothing. This is nothing. This world's nothing compared to the place that I'm going to prepare for you, the place where we can be with one another forever. But much like little children, when they hear their dad talking about going away, that's all they hear. All I heard was dad said I'm going away. I don't know how I feel about that. But Jesus tells them not only is he gonna prepare a place, but he has a plan to prepare the way. When he tells them in verse four, he says, you know the way. You know the way to the place where I am going. So remember, first he told them, uh, I, 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 I'm going to go away, and you couldn't follow me where I'm going, but later you will. Because we understand that. You can't go to where I'm going because you can't die on the cross with me. You can't go to death with me, but later you are going to come, and you're going to be with me, and you know the way. You know the way. Now, for those of us on this side of the cross, Jesus has already died. Jesus has already resurrected. Knowing what he's done for us, this is an absolutely brilliant statement. You know the way. Because Jesus is saying, you know him. You've been with him. You've touched him. You've walked with him. The way has been teaching you. You know, you've seen, you've been with. It's not a path. It's not a, a map. It's not a direction. It's not a GPS coordinate. It's a person. I am the way. Jesus, he is the way. As the disciples walked with Jesus step by step, he was revealing to them the way, that is, he was revealing to them himself. He was revealing himself to be indeed God, but the plan was different than a conquering king that they expected. The way would be finished on the cross by the very way that is Jesus. Let me say that again, because it might have been very confusing. But the way was going to be finished on the cross by the way that was Jesus. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. That's the gospel. That's the truth. He was God. He was the way to the Father, and he made a way on the cross by what he did. And in verse 5, as we continue in this conversation, Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> so how do we know the way? You haven't told us anything. 
Where are you? are you going? East, west, north, south? Are you crossing the river? How can we possibly know the way if we don't even know where you're going? See, what God has planned is so beyond our human knowledge and understanding that he would take the fullness of sin on himself and, and as God die on the cross for us. It's, it's so beyond our understanding. So Thomas is trying to bring it back to human knowledge. Saying, what do we have to do? What route do we have to take? Can, can you just enter it into my Google Maps here? And, uh, and then I'll just hit, you know, route and we'll, we'll, we'll find you at the end. See, and Jesus just wants us to know him. He wants to restore a relationship. He wants to prepare us to understand what he did because of who he is. He gave himself on the cross because he is love. That is the way. It isn't a task, it's a person. It's imputed holiness by a character of grace. That is, it's, it's holiness that we receive because God came to this world sinless to become like us, to take on all of our sin, to give us, uh, by, by his grace-filled life, he gives us holiness by what he did. Holiness given to us by who he is and what he can do. That's the way, that's why he came. And so Jesus helps Thomas and, and Philip and the others understand this, and he tells them very plainly. And here's the I am statement in verse 6. Jesus answered, you want to know the way? I am the way. And the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I'm the way. I'm all truth. I'm all life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Then in verse 7, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on... Trajectory of every branch of the family tree that... From every I'm just trying to think, is that a word for us? <laughs> that was cool. It's kind of scary at the same time. It was like a really intense voice, too. And now I'm going to find where I was. <laughs> so we have this conversation. He's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, you can't come to the Father except for me. And so he's trying to tell them. Well, I'll go back to verse 7. If I already did it, I apologize. So if you really know me, you would know my father as well. But from now on, you do know him. You've seen him. So I'm trying to just open it up more deeply. Guys, I am the way. I am the father. And Jesus is the way because he is truth and life. He is God. God is the creator and sustainer of all truth and life. He is the author of truth. He is the author of life. And Jesus is the fullness of truth and life here in the embodiment. And because of that truth and life, he is the way. And no one can come to the Father except for him. There is no other way. There is no other path. There is just truth and life in Jesus Christ that came from God. And out of his love, he's wanting to explain it to his children. I want to prepare this place and it's going to be awesome. It's better than anything in this life that you've experienced. I want you to come. And no one can come through me. It's not obtainable any other way. There's only one path, and that path is a person. Jesus is the access to the Father because he is the only one from the Father. So he's saying it to us very plainly, but again, Philip and the others on the front side of the cross, but before the resurrection, still this idea is too lofty for them to understand. And Philip says in verse 8, he says, well, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Just show us something. Let us un understand this. They're still not getting it. But I guess it makes sense. If you say you're the way to the Father, then you should be able to show us something. Show us the Father. <laughs> Verse 9, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I am the way. You've seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? And essentially he's saying, believe in my character. Believe because of my character. Believe in how I've acted. I've shown you the Father. We've, we've been walking. The way has been walking with you. 
everything I've done has shown you the Father. He said, or believe in my words that I've spoken. Even my words reveal who I am. In verse 10 it says, the words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. So believe because of my character and believe because of my words. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And the third one here, if we can move forward to the second and the third. Um, Maybe the computers are locked up with that guy who's talking. <clears throat> or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So believe because of my character. Believe because of my words. If nothing else, believe because of my miracles. Believe because of what I've done. Believe that the blind see, the lame walk, and the dead are raised. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the Father, and there's no way except through me. So Jesus is patiently helping Philip and the other disciples understand who he is and what he's about to do on the cross that they will believe that they will be prepared. It's almost like a father having this conversation with his children. In fact, back in 33, he calls them my children as he starts to talk with them in, in the previous chapter. And it's something that's really clear to dad. But the children are, are having a hard time understanding it. You've had that experience, right? You know something as a parent. And it's hard to let your children know what's good or what's right or how to prepare them. Maybe you're going on a, on a long trip and you want to prepare them for, for the babysitter, prepare the, the meal. You want to prepare them for what to expect when you go away. But us, much like our children, we process things through self. We kind of see things in this world. How is it going to affect me? And all I'm hearing is dad's going away. I'm, thank, uh, I'm thankful that Jesus is a better father than I am because my patience is very limited. When my kids ask me questions like for the 20 millionth time, like why can't I eat candy for dinner? Cadence. Why can't I wear shorts and a tank top when it's rainy and cold outside? Karis. Why can't I punch my little brother whenever I want to? Callie. The boy's perfect because he's just like me. But I don't have the patience when these questions get asked and again, why can't I eat candy? Why can't I eat candy? Why can't I eat candy? And I just don't have the patience to deal with it, to explain my higher knowledge as their father. To say, if you eat only candy, you will get sick and die. <laughs> right? If you wear those clothes outside, you will get hypothermia and die. <laughs> One day, <laughs> it feels good at the moment. <laughs> Or uh, just go with it. Watch this one, Todd, right here. One day, your little brother will grow up to be bigger like you, or bigger than you, and he will punch you back, and you may die. No, I don't like to take the time to explain this higher knowledge that I have. They just want to do things as they process it by themselves. It feels good to drink, eat candy. I like dressing like this. Punching my brother is fun. This is the things that they want to do. And out of my mouth uh, comes words that I'm sure every parent in this room has spoken. I might be the only one, and if so, then I just confess in front of all of you. But when they ask me again and again, I say these four words. Because I said so. <laughs> right? Right? Why? Because I, your father, who has greater knowledge than you, said so. <laughs> right? And if there's anyone who's never said that, I need parenting, patience, mentoring from you. So when Jesus says, I am the way, and they're like, why, how? He says, because I said so. No, that's not what he says. He's patiently taking them, his children, helping them understand. Helping them be the best that they can be. 
helping them uh, mold them, to prepare them for what his plan is, for what he wants them to do. He wants them to understand and to come to belief in Jesus because of who he is, what he said, and what he has done. And I want you to remember those three things because I want you to find out more about Jesus, who he is, his character, what he said, the words that he said, and what he's done, the miracles that he's shown to us. He's revealed himself to us. And he's asking for belief and offering eternal life, a place prepared by him. And so these words are spoken to us as well, and I want to ask, what do we decide about Jesus? What do you decide about Jesus? You know, this week I met a man um, who actually just kind of stopped by the church just randomly, and really when I say I met a man, I have to be honest, I had, I had uh, my daughter Cadence with me, and um, he wanted to talk to me, and it felt like the most inopportune time. I was busy getting uh, things ready for this weekend. I had Cadence with me, and, and this, but this guy wanted to talk, and I didn't really want to talk with him, but I did. And God captured my attention through it because God has a funny way of interrupting our lives to capture our attention. And this man had lost everything in the Butte fire. Lost his house, uh, he lost his shop, he didn't have any insurance, he, um, and his shop was a source of income. All of his dogs um, died except for one. There was a dog named Harley who uh, barked in the middle of the night to wake him up so that he could get out of his house literally the second before the whole entire house was consumed by fire. The fire had died down, but it just sparked right back up and blew over his place. He said everything was gone, and his property looks like the surface of the moon. And what was interesting about this conversation was that uh, he was explaining to me that he had his well dug, he had his solar panels all, all set up. He just had a few more things until what he said, I was going to be totally self-sufficient. I was going to be 100% off the grid. And all of a sudden, it was consumed. Everything gone. And he pointed up to the sky and he said, but I think that he didn't want me to feel that I was in control. He didn't want me to feel self-sufficient. He wanted to remind me again that, that he was really in control. So we had this long conversation, and I, at the end, I asked if I could pray for him. and I just kind of prayed as, as God was leading me, and I just felt God calling, you know, just, I want, just bless this guy. God, bless him as he's traveling. Bless him on his journey. Just meet him on the way. Uh, just exceed his expectations of what he's doing. Just every step that he takes, every place that he stops, God, would you just show him you and take care of him? And as I was praying this prayer, he had his eyes open. I had my eyes open, and we were looking at each other as we were just having this, this prayer. And I could see str just tears streaming down his face. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor, just go ahead and tell him thanks. Because he's been doing that. He's been with me. I've never felt God so intently when I gave up myself and God came into my life. He's been walking with me. So just tell him thanks. I said, God, we tell you thanks. See, God captures our attention. He captured my attention with this man. He captured his attention with this fire. But then he gently reveals the way. He gently reveals himself to us. He takes us as his children and says, I've got a better way. I've got a better way than your self-sufficiency. I have a kingdom. I have a place prepared in heaven for you. This morning, you've probably seen this bridge here. And this bridge is, is symbolic of, uh, of the choice that we have about the way that he made. It's often uh, said that the cross bridges this divide uh, of hell as we move from self to crossing over the way into the life of God. And he has made a way. He's given us the choice. Say so we can build our self-sufficiency on the top of a mountain 
and trust in who we are in a temporal world or we can move over and trust that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father and that he has prepared a place for us and that we can live in the eternal kingdom of God with him. We can go trust in ourself where there will be fear, there will be despair, there will be loneliness, or we can trust in God where every tear is wiped away and where we can find our home with him. There's a bridge that we can cross. And so this morning I simply ask, where do you stand? Have you been living in self-sufficiency? Or have you truly tru- crossed over the bridge to say, God, I trust you with my life 100% completely? Where do you stand? Because we can be free and live with God forever. And I want to let you know that you can have this life today if you've never received Jesus Christ, if you've never crossed that bridge. In your uh, worship folder, there's a, a little tear out that I have. And I wrote a prayer down a prayer that can help you just to tell Jesus your intent that you want to let go of your life and you want to trust in his life that was crucified for you. You want to trust in the life that conquered death and hell for you and not your own life. And if you've never done that before, I just want to invite you and, and maybe all of us just to, to pray this prayer. And, and this right now, it's on the screen or it's down here. You can take a look at it. And you can simply pray to Jesus and say this. Let's pray together. Say, so, dear Jesus, I believe that you are the way, the only way. I believe that you alone have truth and you alone bring fullness of life. Today I decide to cross over the bridge from putting my trust in the things of this world and myself to putting my full trust in you and giving you my whole life. Thank you, God, for taking my sin and giving me new life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you pray this prayer, confess that Jesus is the way, the only way. You truly move from the kingdom of self to the kingdom of God, from the kingdom that is temporal to the kingdom that lasts forever. I'm gonna have my friend DJ come and and he's actually gonna move this bridge from here down to the floor. In a minute, I'm actually gonna, or even now the ushers can can come forward. But if you've prayed that prayer, I'd love you to just to, to mark that box and maybe put your name in a best way to contact you. We'd like to know that decision you've made. And, and I may want to ask you to do something that, that could possibly be meaningful for you this morning as you've made that commitment. You've noticed we've made an aisle kind of in the middle and down here, and I'm actually going to you know, come down in the front myself right now. And if you want to come, you can come, and I'm going to be standing here, and there's a box, and the bridge is just sitting right here. You can come and walk down this aisle, and just as a symbol of of, of remembering, as a, a statement, just to come down and walk across this bridge. Say, yes, Jesus, I want to cross. I want you to be my way. I want you to be my life, because you are the truth. I'm going to be right here, and if you want to pray with me, you can. If you want to hug me, you can. And just put your card in here, and we want to contact you. So as we gather the offering, um, don't worry about that. You'll, you might miss it. The best offering that you could give this morning is the offering of your life Amen. to Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you've said that prayer and if you've made that commitment, I just invite you to come. We want to know. And feel free to come and cross this bridge. Let me pray. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. God, if there's anyone who's just hearing your voice, I just pray that you would give them the courage to write their name down, the courage to just symbolically cross this bridge. Because God, you do bring fullness of life. So God, even now as we give our offering, hopefully as we give give our lives to you, but we also just... Uh, give uh, to you that your name may be glorified and that your kingdom would be spread. We just pray that you would bless it and you would receive it. We pray these things in your name. Amen.